So yeah, like you said, my name is Andy Delcom. I go by A. Delcom pretty much everywhere on the internet, GitHub of course, but also uh, Twitter and everything else, you can find me there. And uh, I work at GitHub. I work primarily on the back end of github.com, so I'm gonna talk more about that than like GitHub, the site, as we all use it every day. I'll talk a little bit about the implementation and everything like that, and a little bit about Git, that, uh, and how that affects how we use it at GitHub. So, we're here at uh, YAPC in Asia, and I have a little bit of a confession to make. I don't write Perl. We have <laughs> Ruby at GitHub. That's not quite true. I do write a little bit of Perl. I rarely ever write Perl. For the main GitHub app, this is what we look like, approximately. Something like 300,000 lines of Ruby and about 170 lines of Perl. I do work on this little script. It's one little script, but it's a pretty important little script. It's how we uh, truncate the diffs down on the site. So if a really big diff comes, it's, it's how we make sure that we don't take down the site with a, something much too large. So it is important. So I have a couple of questions before we start. How many of you have ever heard of Git? Raise your hands. Cool. How many of you used it before? You can keep your hands up. And how many of you use it every day? Very cool. And the same for GitHub. How many of you have heard of it? Excellent. How many of you have used it before? And how many of you use it every day? That's awesome. That's good. <laughs> so, like I said at the beginning, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how Git is structured, how that structure affects how we use it at GitHub, a little bit about how we host the Git repos, and then a lot of this stuff is changing right now, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we're m moving from the old system to the new system, which is almost finished. First, talk a little bit about Git. I'm not gonna talk about how the uh, user interface to Git works, or like how you should use it, or best practices, or anything like that. I'm gonna talk about the underlying guts of how Git works, and how the data is stored on, in the repos. This is really important to how we access the Git data on GitHub, because we have to be really efficient, so we have to make sure we're, everything is really fast, and we do things with as few steps as possible. I'll cover this a lot more later, and it becomes really important. So, you may have heard of this before, but everything in Git is stored in what we call the DAG, the D-A-G, or the Directed Acyclic Graph. So basically, everything in Git is stored in this uh, large set of objects, and then there's pointers between all the objects, and those point in a graph. When we think about Git, or the, the DAG in Git, this is sort of generally what we think about. We have a list of commits. You can follow each commit backwards through history, look through the, uh, uh, follow each parent, and uh, get all the way down to history. So if you run git log or something like that, this is how, you, how we'll traverse that history, following each parent back. But this is only one level of the, the way that the graph is structured inside of git. If you look at an individual commit, on the left there, you can see the structure of the commit, and you can see that it does point to its parent but it also points to a tree. And none of the actual git data, the data of the files, is stored inside the commit. It's all stored inside the tree. So if we dereference that pointer and look at the next level down and look at that tree object, we can see it looks sort of like a directory listing. This only has one file in it. This is called readme.md. It's a blob, which means a file. It has a certain mode. But again, we don't have the contents. The contents are stored elsewhere, and we have the pointer to those contents. If we dereference that pointer and look at the object in Git that that contains, we can finally see the contents of that actual blob on disk. So you can see that anytime you want to do anything in Git, you have to follow these, these pointers all the way back. So if we wanted to say, like, four commits back from master, we want to find a specific director or a specific file at a, at a directory path, we have to start at the head work our way back until we find the commit we want, and then traverse all the way down the directories to find the actual file and how it's, uh, and, and its contents. 
So this becomes really important later. This, this iterative lookup uh, can cause us a lot of problems if we're not efficient with it. So that's, that's my uh, basics about Git. Like I said, nothing about the user interface, but moving on. So I work at GitHub, and we host Git repos. And there's a little bit of a secret here. If you have only one Git repo, it's really easy to host it. There's not a lot to it. You can actually create and host your own Git repo on a server that you have access to. If you create a repo on the server and then add that as a remote, anything you have SSH access to, you can pull from that, push to it. Every, every entire repo is exactly the same. Every one is, is fully blessed. There's no, there's no special repositories in Git. Everyone is exactly the same. So if you wanted to do this on GitHub, you can create a new repository. You've probably have seen this page before if you use GitHub. You can add it as a remote, and then you can push to it and pull from it, just like, just like we could with our, our own server. So there's nothing particularly special about this. You can see that the files show up. So at its most basic level, GitHub is really just a Git host. So the code hosting, I mean, it's sort of like the fundamental. It's what, what we need to have, of course, to make this work. But uh, it's not what makes GitHub interesting. There's all this other stuff that we build around GitHub, the, the collaboration, the forking, the, the pull requests. That's why I think that GitHub is, is um, interesting and why we all use GitHub every day. But I work on the low level of GitHub. I work on how we actually store the Git data. So that's really interesting to me. So even though it's sort of this, like this most basic level, I find that really interesting. So hosting a single Git repo is easy. This is probably not so secret. But if you have a lot of Git repos, it's not so easy anymore. We have a lot of problems now. And GitHub has a lot of repositories, somewhere north of 7 million repositories on disk. We handle approximately about a million and a half pushes per day, something like 100 million pulls and clones. All this is across about 27 file servers. And we have about 100 terabytes of online storage. So it's not quite so simple anymore. We're no longer in the case of just having one repo on one, uh, one server. So how do we manage all this? How do, we, how do we get the Git data from a repository and show it on the web? How do we, how do we create that, that page I showed before? The answer is that it's changing. We are currently almost done with a big migration to move from the old system to the new system. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the old system worked, about how the new system works and why, it's, why we're moving to it, and then a little bit about how we uh, went through this whole process. So the old system is fundamentally based on this uh, library that we have called Grit. It's kind of an interesting fun fact here. Grit actually predates GitHub. So the first commit to GitHub was on October 19th, 2007. It's almost seven years old. First commit to Grit was 10 days earlier, October 9th. So we actually built this library to access Git data from Ruby before we actually started on the web app itself. I think this is kind of cool. So Grit, at its most fundamental level, is a Ruby wrapper around Git. We shell out to Git, we parse the results, we make them accessible in a programmatic way, but it's pretty simple. It can look something like this. You create a new repo against a new Grit repo that points at something, and you can do things like show me all the commits. And this works basically for everything. You can uh, look up individual files, you can look up files by paths, you can look at the history, you can do rev lists, you can do diffing, merging, all of that stuff. But it only works locally. You have to have direct access to that file system to be able to access the repositories. And remember, we have 27 file servers. These are not on the front end. This is not where the web traffic is served. We can't access the repos locally anymore. So we had a solution for this. Uh, it's called GFS, which is a file system that allows you to uh, make it look like all the, all the um, front ends share the same storage. That did work for a while, but it didn't scale well, and it was really, really crumbling underneath us. 
we had to move really, really fast to a new system that allowed us to have all of these file servers and access the things efficiently. So we added this level layer in between uh, Grit and the file servers that we call Smoke. This is uh, Grit in the cloud. <laughs> a little inside joke, I guess. So now this is more like what the situation looks like. A request comes in to one of the front ends. Maybe this is for a repository page. Maybe the Rails repo. I was going to say the Perl repo there, but apparently it's not hosted on GitHub, so I can't make that reference. Maybe someday. We look the repository up in what we call chimney. The chimney is basically the router that tells us where all of the repositories live. Tells, it, tells each front end which file server that repo lives on. Then each front end makes a direct connection to the file server and pulls back the Git data that it needs. And this is actually really important. So even though we have this chimney routing layer, it's not a, it's not a blocker. We don't send the data through that one choke point. It's just a lookup. It's actually just Redis. So it's really, really simple, which means that we can scale both the front ends and the file servers out horizontally as basically as far as we need without, without a single point that we need to scale up. This works really well for us. And this is the other really important thing that we did. So Smoke takes and makes these uh, grit calls happen over the wire, but it does it completely transparently to the app. We literally replace the constants in the Ruby app between grit and Smoke. So the application itself has no idea that anything's happening over the wire. We didn't have to rewrite anything to be able to move to this new setup. This worked, this was super important. Like I said, the, the app was literally crumbling underneath us. This was a few years ago. So this works really well. This was hugely important at the time to be able to do this move really fast. But there's some problems here. Let's say you have something like this. So ls tree is how you look up all the files in a directory. And then load blob is how you would load that file off disk. This might be for something like gist. I don't know if you've heard of gist, but it just kind of shows the, it's like a little paste bin. You can see all the files. So we're going to make one grit call to load the tree. And then for each file in that tree, we're going to make another grit call to load the blob, to load the data. In the old grit scenario, this worked fine. We're local. File system access is relatively fast compared to the network. We would need to cache these results, but it wasn't a huge problem. But as we moved to this new system with Smoke, now we're making actual TCP connections to a backend file server at this point for each blob in the tree. This is really expensive. We call this death by round trip. So for every one of those, those blobs in that tree, we have to make a new connection to the file server. We make, make a new round trip to get the data. This doesn't really work very well. So we need to, uh, so also like shelling out is slow with grit. So grit, every single time it makes that connection on the, the back end, it has to shell out to get, to get the data. So we needed a new system for sort of both of these problems, both the round trip problem where we're going to the file servers, but also not having to shell out to get for each of these commands. So before I kind of get to the solution that we used, I need to talk a little bit about the history of Git. This is a very short history of Git. It probably has mistakes, but the important points are there. Originally, the Linux kernel was stored in this tool called BitKeeper. The team used it, and uh, it had a lot of the same features that Git does. It was decentralized, each repo was separate. But BitKeeper was proprietary, and there was a falling out between the BitKeeper team and the Linux core team. And so they needed to move to a new system. So Linus Torvalds, the primary author of Linux, basically went off for a few weeks and wrote the beginnings of Git as a thing to store the Linux kernel in. So he wrote all of the, the basic object storage layer, things like that. So this is originally written by Linus Torvalds. Now it's maintained by a man named Junio. Linus doesn't maintain it anymore. It's open source. They're not going to have the same proprietary problems that they had with BitKeeper. 
And also, the license for Git is GPLv2, so it's the same as the Linux kernel. And this becomes important later if you want to link against it. So, Git's written in C. We want a shared library that we can link against. We should be able to just link against Git and call into all these functions that already know how to connect to the uh, Git repo. There's a few problems with this. First of all, all of Git was implemented effectively as a command line tool. So all of the C code was written with the intent that uh, basically no, there, weren't, there wouldn't be any really long running commands, or not particularly long running. So the memory management is a little kind of hit or miss. Doesn't do a lot of freeing of memory because usually the commands will just end and you don't have to handle that. There's not a lot of good error handling. Pretty much whenever Git hits something that it doesn't like, it just exits the process, which when you're writing a command line tool is totally fine. But if you're linking against it, you don't, want it, you don't want your web process to die just because there's something wrong in the Git repo. And finally, even if the technically this was possible, there's political concerns and legal concerns. Git is GPLv2, and that's a viral license. If you link against it, that would indicate that you have to open source your app. It would be kind of a fun experiment to see what open sourcing GitHub would look like, but that's pretty unlikely to happen. That's kind of a non-starter for us. So, there was a project started called libgit2. This was a ground up rewrite of Git. It was intended from the beginning to be a good shared library. So it has same error, error handling, better memory management, and best of all, it's clean room implemented and it's licensed LGPL. So none of the code from Git itself lives in libgit2. There's actually a few exceptions to that where there's specific permission from the authors in Git to relicense their code under LGPL, but primarily everything is rewritten from the ground up. So this project got started, and then as often happens with open source, it didn't really get enough steam behind it, and it kind of just withered on the vine. Instead, a different project called JGit, which is implemented in Java, kind of got most of the, the share of the um, open source developer community in Git. It kind of pulled ahead, and it was much more feature complete. And at GitHub, we don't use Java. We don't use JRuby. We can't really link against a Java library very easily. So this didn't really work for us. So we came back to libgit2. There was a summer of code project uh, a few years ago. And the student in that summer of code project was now one of my coworkers, uh, the Sup Martin. And he basically went, spent the summer, and then the following fall, and that winter, and basically until today, two years later, or three years later, uh, working on libgit2 full time. And now libgit2 is pretty much feature complete. It doesn't have quite every single thing in Git. There's a few exceptions, but pretty much everything that we need at GitHub is implemented in libgit2. Now, it's not even the case that GitHub is the only maintainer. Microsoft is a really big maintainer of libgit2 Lib Lib as well. And they have uh, a C-sharp implementation, or a C-sharp library that links against libgit2 as well, which they use in Visual Studio for all of their Git support. So they have a vested interest in this as well at this point. So now we have this library that we can use, that we can link against, so we're not, we don't have to do shelling out anymore like we did with Grid. We obviously need some layer in between that we're not linking directly against the C in Ruby land. And uh, the Ruby wrapper around libgit2 is called Rugged. It's just a C extension, so it, it just connects and make, makes all the calls that needs to happen in libgit2. Like I said, it's a Ruby wrapper around libgit2. So grit was a Ruby wrapper around git itself. So now we have this new version of git called libgit2, and now we have this new Ruby wrapper around it called Rugged. The code looks basically the same. The APIs are a little bit different, but it looks basically like Grit did, just with a slightly different API. You can access pretty much everything the same way. You can see, you know, commit history, walk, walk the trees, you can look up individual files by path, everything like that. Uh, another thing, uh, just like in Ruby, we needed an extension that links against libgit2. There is one for Perl. I've never used it. Like I said, I don't really write Perl very much, but it's called Git Raw. 
the Piercing NC Pan that's developed on GitHub. Uh, at a cursory glance, it looked like it, was work it worked pretty well. It looks pretty complete, at least. Uh, but I have never used it, so it might be terrible. But I hope nobody who is here wrote it. So we've got rugged to replace grit, and so we can link against, or we can access the Git repos. But just like with grit, where that can only happen locally, the same thing is true with rugged. Rugged can only operate against the local files. So we need a replacement for that smoke layer as well. And this is basically what I work on all the time. We call this Git RPC. We're making the calls against the remote server. And it's basically like smoke, but better. It uses the same wire protocol, but uh, it has a bunch of features built into it. One of them is caching. So like many large sites, uh, GitHub would basically fall to its knees without a big level of mem lem layer of memcache there. In Smoke, we had to kind of have this layer around it that did the caching. And it was very ad hoc and one off. Many things did not work well with it, and we had a lot of we had we had a lot of fun sort of finding all the places we needed to add caching and then going back and adding them later. We didn't start out with caching in mind. GetRPC, on the other hand, has caching built into the protocol from the ground up. So in the client, we add caching with every single call and think about how we should cache that call. We have pluggable <coughs> wire protocols. So right now, the, proto the wire protocol is the same as Smoke was using because it was simple for us to implement. But we want to move to a new, a new system. The system we use right now um, has a bunch of problems. It's kind of developed internally. It is open source but effectively we're the only people who use it. And it's really opaque. Uh, another problem with it is, is that BirdRPC, or the, the, the wire protocol is called BirdRPC. It doesn't support encoding tagged strings. And we're dealing with all this text data from the, from the Git storage. So we want to move to a protocol, a wire protocol that does support that, that encoding problem. So GitRPC, in general, this is one of the big changes from Smoke, is fully encoding aware. So there's this kind of funny thing about Git. Git calls itself, yeah, the stupid content tracker. This is in the man page. This is really what it says. There's an emphasis on this stupid part. Git doesn't care about encodings. Git doesn't care about much of anything. It just stores bytes on disk. It does this really small level where it tries to detect the difference between uh, text and binary which effectively it does by seeing if there's any null bytes in the file. And there's plenty of encodings that are text-based that have null bytes in them, like UTF-16. So Git does not do a good job at this at all. And the problem was that Smoke didn't either. Smoke just took the bytes off the file server and sent them directly to the front end. If these were not in uh, encoding means expected, like ASCII, or UTF-8, like something like shift -shifts. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do the right thing as sort of the, at the sort of the protocol level. We would do one-off little things for each individual page to make sure that we transcoded UTF-8. So maybe like the page that shows the files would work fine, but maybe the blame one didn't, things like that. It didn't, it wasn't holistic throughout the system. So like I said, GetRPC is encoding aware. We're moving to uh, a wire protocol that does support tagged encodings, but right now, we send the encoding alongside the string in BirdRPC, and we try and detect and tag the string as close as possible to the data. So basically, as soon as we read the data off the disk and on the file server, we do encoding detection using libICU, and then we tag the string. So that way, throughout the whole system, Everything is correctly tagged, and we, have, we know the encodings for all the strings. Then, when we're displaying the files, everything we display on the web is UTF-8. So we know that we can transcode in one spot. We have one code path now that handles all of the transcoding of blob data, file data, onto the website. So every path that displays any of that file data will probably get transcoded and should display properly. This is getting better all the time better than it was a year ago, 
we have more ways to go. I know that uh, encodings are kind of a problem in GitHub, and I've heard about it from many Japanese users and companies, things like that, but we are getting better at it, and hopefully we'll get better. So, we have this old system, and we have this new system. The new system is better in many ways, but we have to make this switch somehow. It's taken about two years so far, and we obviously couldn't make this as one big holistic change. If I'd opened that pull request two years ago, it would still be open today, and we would never merge it. It would be horrendously huge. We use Git in a lot of places on GitHub, unsurprisingly. So what we did is, we basically did the migration on master. We had both protocols available to us from the beginning. This is basically what the code looked like. There's a little more error handling, but this is actually how, how these things worked. So we had one method called git that allowed us to access everything via smoke. This was the old method. And we had the new one called RPC. And we could move stuff over to that new method as we went. This is important because everything that changed between smoke and get RPC was just at the protocol level, it was at the API. The way that we stored the repos on disk didn't change. We still were accessing the Git repos basically in the same way. And so there was no, no need to separate things out and say that these repos would only be accessible via Git RPC and these could be accessible via smoke. That didn't have to happen. So we still had to make all of these changes over and we, like I said, we used Git in a lot of places on github.com. And we used a few different methods to help us switch over. Probably the biggest one is we used this tool called Graphite. This is a graphing library. It was originally written at orbits.com. And uh, it's basically a round robin database. It's like RRD tool, if you're familiar with that. But it allows us to graph many different things. And at GitHub, what we did is we graphed every single call through both Smoke and GitRPC. So we could see our progress over time. And we also didn't graph just the calls but also the timing of each call. So we could see that over time we weren't making anything slower or that we weren't making a bunch more calls happen because we messed the caching up or something like that. We could see that everything was looking basically right at this very high level from uh, the graphing library. So I have some graphs to show the uh, difference. These are some graphs from about a year ago. These show about a month of data. This was the graph that I looked at a lot to decide to what to work on next. This is the graph of all smoke calls that were happening on github.com. And basically what I would do is I would just, whenever I finished one moving something over, I would look at this graph, see what was using the most number of calls, try and find somewhere in the app that was using that, and move it over to get RPC. Rinse and repeat over and over again. Everything would be eventually moved over if we just kept doing this. This is the graph of GetRPC calls from uh, a year ago. There were, we're making about 500,000 calls per minute a year ago in smoke on this slide. Popping out maybe, maybe a little above 600,000 there. In GetRPC, we were doing about 200,000 calls. So as of a year ago, we were about a year into the project. So we had lots, of, we had a good start at this point. We still had a long ways to go. I like this graph too. This was the percentage of total Git calls going through Git RPC. So the goal was just always to make this move up into the right. During this month, about a year ago, we didn't make a ton of progress, but we were still working on it. So where are we today? This is that same graph of the percentage of Git, Git RPC calls going through Git, or Git calls going through Git RPC over the past year. So we're basically really, really, really close to being done. We're somewhere like 99.9% .9 of all Git calls going through Git RPC now. This is the Git RPC call graph from the past week or so, as of a few days ago. We're topping out somewhere like around 1.2, 1.3 million calls per minute. So it's gone up quite a bit, maybe a factor of five or six from a year ago. Everything still seems to be holding up. This is the graph of the smoke calls as of this week. We're doing something like 
maybe 100 spikes above 100 calls per minute. We're getting really, really, really close. But we're not done yet. We still have to find those last 50 to 100 calls per minute, that last 0.1%. And this is like really solidly long tail territory, if you've ever heard that term. We're no longer at this point where we can find like a big thing that uses a lot of calls and just wipe out thousands of calls per minute in one go. Every one of those calls left is basically called really rarely, only every now and then, and it's really challenging to find where they are. So we have this tool internally that we call Backscatter, and this is how we're finding that last little bit. It basically has two modes. Actually, it has three modes. We haven't gotten to the last one yet. The first mode is call counting. So this literally just counts how many kinds methods are called. You do something like this. You just add the method in to the method call, add backscatter measure, and then every time that call or that method gets called, we count it. We put it in graphite so we can see it. For the smoke stuff, this wasn't quite as critical. Many times we don't know how often a method's getting called, but with smoke, we have those API graphs, so we know about how many are happening. But still, those are happening over the wire, and we have a lot of caching, so we don't know exactly how many times the methods were getting called. This is for a different method, but basically you get this graph of how many times the methods are getting called. This graph, or this method, is not getting called very often, so you can totally just measure this without a problem. So the second mode for uh, backscatter is called, we call it tracing, method tracing. So once we know that we don't have so many calls that we're gonna overwhelm the, the app, because the method tracing is somewhat expensive, we can add in this trace call. And this does take a parameter. So that, that 20 says that one out of every 20 calls will actually get traced. So this allows us to trace methods that are still getting called quite a lot. When we first put this in, that was about a month ago, and there were still quite a few get calls happening, and so we wanted to, to turn that down so we weren't gonna overwhelm anything. But this is really cool. This gets us pages that look like this. So this is basically the last few calls that happen for that specific get call. It's basically just this get trees API, which is what we're gonna move over next. That's what I've been working on this week, effectively. So we're moving closer and closer and closer. We're almost done, it should be really soon now when we're fully moved over. But it's been a really long project. So to recap, how do we move over this like fundamental part of the app? The way that we did it, and the way that I think works well, if you can, run both concurrently. Run the old system and the new system side by side. So you can do the migration of each step on master in your repo. You don't have to do a big pull request to do the whole rewrite all in one go. You wanna try and measure as much as possible about what's happening with the old system and the new system. So that way you can actually use data to drive your decisions. You're not just guessing at what's happening. And then finally, when you're really, really close and you're trying to mi migrate that last few percent, see if you can use some sort of method tracing to find all of the last places that actually get used. Thanks a lot. Again, my name is Andy Delcom. You can find me on the internet there. And I have a few resources if you want to look. Um, there's, there's two talks there at the bottom. Uh, one is by my coworker Zach Holman, how GitHub uses GitHub to build GitHub. This talks about a lot of the collaboration tools and uh, the pieces that we use to sort of discuss and move and make the migration over. So not, not the code level stuff, but the higher level social stuff about how to move stuff over. And then that last one is by uh, Vicent Marti. It's called My Mom Told Me Git Doesn't Scale. And he's talking about uh, the very beginnings of the Git or PC migration. So this was given about two years ago at the very start of this. Now we're basically done. And that first one, it's called Git for Computer Scientists. And it describes in a really well level of detail, a really good level of detail, the way that Git works sort of in the database layer, how, how all the objects point to each other. And I think it really makes, it helped me understand how, the, how Git worked. And I hope it would for you too, maybe. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening.